I am fascinated, you know, I call my books identity thrillers. It's not really a genre, but I think it should be because it's the type of thriller or suspense or mystery, whatever you want to call it, where the suspense revolves around the, the, the puzzle of the secrets that people keep. Um Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview our guest today is Deborah Goodrich Royce and we are going to be talking about her latest novel Reef Road, which is my first book reporter book bets on selection of 2023. I read this book and immediately said this is the book that I am ready to get readers behind this year. And it's also an indie next pick the indie, indie booksellers were way behind it as well. Now I had the pleasure of hearing Deborah talk about this book uh, over the summer at pre publication event. And it was one of those things where I walked out of the room saying, this book sounds so good. Her backstory on this book was so great that I was dying to delve into it. So when I saw Set at a Beach in January, I was ready to be there. So welcome, Deborah. It's so nice to have you here today. Thank you, Carol. I'm so happy to talk with you again. I know. Happy we've been here. I know. It's been a year. It's been actually a year since we had our last conversation. Okay. So let's start by you telling us about Reef Road and you doing the setup for me. So on December the 10th, 1948, a girl was murdered in Pittsburgh. She was 12 years old. Uh, her real name was Carol, and she was one of my mother's best friends. The girls were 12 at the time. My mother was supposed to have been there that night at her friend's house. And for whatever reason, my grandmother said no. And Carol was home alone when the parents came home from bowling. They were very adamant about how they had left the house locked up. This was in a very working class neighborhood of Pittsburgh called Homewood Brushton. And they were row houses, so completely connected side to side, front door, back door. Parents were very clear about how locked up the house was. They got home at 1130 that night. The back door was open. The shade was pulled up it was a, a door with a window mm -hmm. and there was a trail of blood from the kitchen where carol had been baking a cake to this three-legged telephone table in the dining room where they found her collapsed she'd been stabbed 36 times mm -hmm. and there was an incongruous 21 minute lag from the moment the parents entered the house as the neighbors clocked mm -hmm to when two things happen. The father called the police and the mother ran outside of the house screaming. So to this day, which is 75 years exactly, it has remained an unsolved crime. And I really, when the pandemic locked down, closed us in, you know, I keep using my hands this <laughs> way to, to give you the visual of constraints. Yeah. When the pandemic shut us down in spring of 2020, I was on book tour for the paperback of my first book, Finding Mrs. Ford. And of course, like everybody in the world, I, I froze where I was, which wasn't freezing, it was Palm Beach, Florida. And I thought, now is my moment to research the real murder. I feel like I've always known about it. I mean, obviously my mother didn't tell me about it when I was a little girl, but I have the sense that in, you know, somewhere around adolescence, my mother was frank about this. And my mother, it had a tremendous effect on her. And I think she always, from what she understood of it as a child, because she was only 12, as I said, she had the sense that someone had come in, a stranger, this, this intruder had come into this household. And so the effect it had on her is it made her fearful at home. The invention of the home security alarm system was a very good thing for my mother, and it made her overprotective as a mother. Mm. So when the lockdown hit, I thought I'm finally going to research it. And the fascinating thing, there's so much material now, because of course, in the era of the internet, people upload everything. Yes. So there were dozens and dozens of newspaper articles. I was able to get the coroner's report. I was not able to get the police report because it isn't, uh, the case isn't closed because it's never been solved. 
So as I was re researching it, and as I was in Florida, and as the pandemic was sort of hemming us in, and it was a very claustrophobic feeling, mm -hmm. I chose not to write it as nonfiction. I didn't really want to get into all the details of the real case, nor did I want to point a finger where I think the finger should be pointed. And what I really wanted to get to was the essence of the truth. I wanted to examine both generational trauma and tangential trauma, the kind of trauma that we experience when we're not exactly the victim, mm -hmm. but the victim is someone close to us. And it is a well-known syndrome. And I did a lot of research in something called epigenetics, which we can really go down that rabbit hole. So basically, Reef Road is a dual narrative. It, it is set in Palm Beach in the pandemic, and we can talk about that in the lockdown. And it's the story of a writer a lonely writer who lives alone with her dog behind a grocery store in a dingy apartment. And she's obsessively researching the murder of her mother's best friend and all kinds of really arcane murder statistics in general. And then there's another story, almost like a book within a book, story of a wife, a younger woman, who's, uh, her name is Linda Alonzo, and she's married to a very handsome fellow from Buenos Aires named Miguel Alonzo. And about three weeks into the lockdown, he disappears with the two little children. And she's frantic and calls the police and security footage reveals him getting on a plane at Miami International, bound for Argentina with the kids in, of course, his face mask. And she cannot follow because of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So you, the story toggles back and forth and you start to peel the onion of what one woman has to do with the other. Now, and really, it's written from these two different points of view. So you're in the writer's thoughts and the wife. And was it always set up like that? Did you always know that that's the way you were going to be, you know, doing the book? I did. And, and that happened very early on. I mean, I'm certainly an editor and I use editors and I edit and edit and edit. But I felt very clearly that I wanted to have these two perspectives. I like to write a twist, as you know, from my other books. And people always say, well, what's the difference between a reveal and a twist? And of course, a reveal, you're, you're in Agatha Christie. There are 10 people in a room. One person's dead. Someone else did it. At a certain point, you figure, you know, who that person was. Right. In a twist, you get to the point where you realize this might not be, it's not at all the story I thought I was reading. Something else entirely is going on. And so having the two perspectives, uh, the writer's voice is in first person. Her sections are like journal entries. And I wanted the reader to be very, very close in her head. And then Linda's sections are third person close. So I wanted you to know her thoughts. But <laughs> Linda's storyline is a little bit more noir. Mm -hmm. And I think in noir, you always should pay very close attention to the woman. And her sections were very much influenced by Body Heat, mm -hmm. that fantastic movie mm -hmm. with Kathleen Turner and William Hurt, which is, you know, one of the best film noirs. And it is set in Lantana, Florida, uh, Body Heat, which is a few miles away from where I was writing. And in that film, you have the sense I want the reader to have here of the heat and the everybody's sweaty and everybody's up to no good. And I wanted that feeling in this mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. And it opens with these boys on the beach. And I love that these kids are on the beach. They're not supposed to be on the beach. They've gone under the caution tape to not be on the beach. Their mother said, don't go to the beach. They're on the beach and they discover something. And now what do they do? Like they're not supposed to be there. Can yeah. I tell anybody? And they completely ignore someone who's sitting on the beach. Like they completely well, can see. Yeah. And so a, a few aspects that that prologue came later. And I love that prologue so much. It is so delicious to me. It sets so many elements of tone. You get the feeling of heat. You get the feeling it's high noon and the sun is beating straight down on them, casting no shadows, almost as if they're not even there. And so that's a funny feeling. And I think we did have that feeling in the pandemic. Am I here? Do I exist? 
no one can see me. Everything was, you know, here we are. And then everything was askew. And of course they, they're surfers. And I had to do my surfer research with my son-in-law and his brother. I was about to have the surfers carrying their surfboards on their shoulders, but that is a no-no. They carry them under their arms. I now know that. So one of my most fun surfer speech lines I got to write, uh, what the boys discover is a seagull fighting over a severed human hand. And one brother says to the other, you know, dude, do you think it's real? And <laughs> the other brother says, the seagulls do. <laughs> I, love that. I loved writing that, but they don't see the woman. As they're leaving the beach, there's a woman sitting there and they don't see. So we can talk about perspective. Often in a thriller, one is advised not to head up, to stay in the head or the point of view of the character you are focusing on in that chapter, let's say. In the prologue, I very much head hop. It's from a very omniscient point mm -hmm. of view. So whoever is narrating it uh, sees the boys and sees the woman. And she's a woman of a certain age. And I wanted to make that point. And that is a very pertinent point. She's sitting there in khaki pants and some, you know, sunblock hat. And she's the kind of women that men don't see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that in this book. Who's a woman that men see? Who's a woman that men don't? And how does that impact us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when they look, what are they seeing when they look at you? Oh, we write her off. Oh, we don't do this. You know, and it was interesting because they find this hand and you completely then you change out of the story. Like those boys do not appear again. So you said you wrote that later. Did you just know that you needed a setup or, or you know, what, what, what prompted that? Because we don't come back to the boys. Like the boys, when something's found later on, they don't sit there and go, oh, we saw that at the beginning, you know? No, it is referred to later. We know later we're tracking the discovery of the beach and we do realize who the woman was at the beach that day. She certainly has a voice. Yeah, I, I they just serve their purpose. They are just mm -hmm. neighborhood boys and... Uh, they set so many aspects of the tone of the novel. Mm -hmm. Well, as I was reading, I felt like the writer could also be called the watcher because she is watching and observing. She knows a lot about Linda as she follows her. She's following her around. She's putting pieces together. And it's got this very creepy element to the story of this woman who you just picture standing across the street. I was thinking of that show that um, was on a couple of months ago, that haunted house in Westfield. And in the haunted house, they're just the people who sit on the lawn chair across the street. And I was picturing her like the people in the lawn chair. Linda walks out of her house and there she is again, just standing there. And very cinematic feeling when you sit there and think about what she was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the books that really influenced me, and it was also a movie, was Notes on a Scandal by Zoe Heller. Mm -hmm. And they made a film of it with uh, Judy Dench and Kate Blanchett. It's a different story entirely, but it is an older woman, a younger woman. The older woman is kind of weird and kind of obsessive as we have in this book. And I like that uh, dynamic of the two women and what is, again, what is really going on here. It isn't what you think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she is a watcher for sure. For sure. And she's been watching for a long time, watching a lot of people and- that's going to come into play. In the timing of, of the book against the pandemic, it's not what I would call a pandemic novel per se. And I know a lot of readers like shy away from books like, oh, I don't want to talk about the pandemic again. And the timing's there because it works for certain plots, plot twists that happen within the book. Certain plot movements have to have it, but it's not obsessed with the virus. I mean, at the beginning when the boys are on the beach they, they say they don't want to touch the hand, it could be infected with the coronavirus. And it was yeah. just really funny because that is something that people would have thought back right. in that time. That was totally, we were watching the groceries. I mean, we were, yeah, we were Cloroxing our bananas, I confess. So yeah, it, it was a time that was unprecedented, certainly in our lifetimes. We have not, we who live here have not lived through war or, or pandemic that way. Certainly people in other parts of the world. The pandemic to me, was unignorable and it was, I think, a perfect setting for this book because 
It put a box around your characters. Alice McDermott in her book, What About the Baby? Mm -hmm. uh, she talks about writing and she basically says in nonfiction, you have to include everything. You have to get every single detail in there that really happened. In fiction, you are you are creating the constraints. You're putting a wall around the characters. You're leaving things out. So in every way, I thought the pandemic, it served the purpose like a wartime setting. You know, if you're reading a book that's mm -hmm. set in World War II, there are gonna be certain things that characters can and can't do, certain movements that are restricted. You know what it means if, if suddenly you're in Germany or you're in Amsterdam, like Anne Frank, or you're in Paris, in Vichy, France, or or you're in New York, you know, mm -hmm. they're gonna be blackouts. So you know these things that are going on and it doesn't have to be oppressive. And then you know, let's talk about the things. So Miguel gets on the plane. Mm -hmm. It worked perfectly that Linda could not follow. How would I have done that if we didn't have this quarantine, this lockdown? And I, I also, think it helped to add to both the hothouse and the madhouse feeling that mm -hmm. starts to engulf everybody. Yeah. It's like, you can't go there. She can't follow the children. And it's because of the government. It's not like her husband saying, don't come. It's not like, oh, it's not, they're in school or something. Like that. No, it's just work. I'm going with them. I'm escaping, you know, with them. And you're going to have to stay here because this is what's going on. Why did he take the children? What, what's going on? What's the whole, and you have this whole of what's going on with that, but she can't follow. And that's not something she can get around. Can really, I, really interesting. No. Yeah. You, and the first half of the book is this setup that it moves slowly, giving you clues, like as you're paying attention and the writing and what ifs keep you reading. And it's very, very, you're moving along at this pace. Were you very conscious of the pace as you were writing that beginning section? Because I feel like it just worked because then we'll talk about what happens next, the flip. I'm always very conscious of pacing. I, I generally like short chapters. I like, um, look, you're going to get the same amount of material in, whether your chapters are this long or that long. You know, the book is the book. Uh, what I like about short chapters is rhythm. Uh, that, that idea of controlling this pace, having a bit of a cliffhanger, and this slow unveiling, I think we are grown up intelligent readers. And I find it interesting when something unveils in that way, where you, you're just, you're building this, this um, structure that you don't even understand, mm -hmm. but you're getting a little bit more of the piece of the puzzle every turn. And then there's a slam. I, because I think so cinematically, I tend to structure my book books in three acts. Okay. So there's always a bit of a surprise. If, if it's a 300 page book, let's say, always a bit of a surprise around page 100, always a bit of a surprise around page 200, and then usually something in the middle. So you could divide it in half or divide it in thirds. That's the way I think of it. Um, and it just keeps my interest. I think structure and pacing is very important. So years ago, Linda Gardner, I mean, she told me that she would lay out the story on the floor and she would put color cards of action, not action. Like, you know, this was happening, that was happening along the way. And if there were too many, let's say red cards, they need to be split up. And so when you're sitting there, it was very methodical of the way she was looking at it, saying, I've got this pace, there's too much happening. And then over here, there's a lull and too much of a lull. Are you actually going back to read and saying, wait a second, what can I drop in here for some extra action? Absolutely. I do that all the time. And like my first book, Finding Mrs. Ford, it's nonlinear and it's nonlinear twice. And I did lay it out on the floor at a certain point. And I have dogs and cats and you know, you're laying things <laughs> on the floor. You're like, get out of this room. <laughs> but I, I, I think you know, paces, pacing is extremely important in a film and it's extremely important in a book. And things, it's not interesting if a book moves fast from the get-go and stays at the same velocity 
until the end, then it's like you're shot out of a cannon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you do need to sort of advance and retreat. I mean, I've heard people describe music that I'm not a musician, but in music, not only do they write the notes, but they write the silence between the notes and they write the length of the silence between the notes. It's controlled as it should be. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the short chapters. It was something I definitely saw as I was reading. You felt it was definitely intentional, but you also felt when you were reading, it's going to be three pages. It was going to be four. It was three. I'll do three more. I'll do four more. But there keeps was also, yeah. it keeps you going because wait a second, wait, I could do four more. I could do three more. And especially at night when you're getting ready to go to sleep. Oh, wait, not for me. It was like two more before dinner, two more chapters before dinner. And I really, really love that. And then about halfway through the book, the pace picks up and it picks up noticeably. And from there, we're sort of on this ride where the tension's palpable and the truth was somewhat evident until the end. And then it's not. And who's to be trusted and how crazy was the writer and how cunning and clever was the wife? So there's where I felt it all took off. And it's like, wait a second, I've got all these questions now about these people that I've met all along the way and I've come to know, but do I really know them? Right. I am fascinated. You know, I call my books identity thrillers. It's not really a genre, but I think it should be because it's the type of thriller or suspense or mystery, whatever you want to call it, where the suspense revolves around the 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 puzzle of the secrets that people keep. Uh, you know, in film, you might call it Hitchcockian. Um, examining, you know, what is really going on here? Are people really revealing everything? And once you live a minute on this planet, you do have the experience of meeting people who aren't exactly who they say they are, mm -hmm. or people who, I, we all compartmentalize to a certain degree. You're not the exact same person with your mother as you are with me, but most of us, the gradations are fairly narrow, but occasionally you meet people where the great gradations are extreme and quite shocking. And I think that's what's really interesting in these kinds of thrillers. Um, secret. It's like a melding between a braiding of true crime and fiction. It's both like going together because we're in this true crime that happened and you're narrating your own version of it. But we've got this. We've got this fiction, but we've got this crime that did happen back here. That's sort of grounding the whole book. And how are these people related? How is this all related within this? And do you like true crime? Do you like watching true crime shows? I do. So many years ago as a young actress, I did the TV movie or miniseries about Ted Bundy with Mark Harmon. Mm. And I played the woman who actually married him. They cut some of that out of what was released in the end because he was still alive on death row when we did it. She was still alive and she just had a daughter with him. I mean, we did this really as it was all playing out and the studio was afraid of being sued, but that really got into my consciousness. What was all that about? What was she thinking? How mm -hmm. on earth did she marry this guy? I mean, she really followed him from the Pacific Northwest. She probably played a part in his jailbreak and uh, mm -hmm. escape when he got out of jail. It was in Utah or Colorado and then made his way to Florida and went down there and he put her on the witness stand. And in the middle of this gruesome, just horrific murder trial, he had done his research and he said, will you marry me? And she said, yes. He said, then I do hereby marry you. And it was legal and binding. So what was up with her? We All right, we can look at him and say, okay, so he's a psychopath. So there's a chip missing, there are chromosomes missing, whatever's missing, that's a person that we'll never understand. But her, what on earth? That's what fascinates me. Yes, yeah. It's why do you move into that circle where you know things are so crazy? You know, last Friday night, I was riveted as I was watching the deadline piece about the Idaho killings. And- it was on for two hours. I was like, well, just watching the screen. It interested me how much false information got out there. Everything from the police stopping him in Indiana to examine his hands, like none of this stuff actually happened. And these leads that were perpetuated on TikTok. 
and how people were saying this is what happened and that's what happened. And when you watch these people on TikTok, they act like they're news reporters that are reporting the news and it's not close to what the truth is. And it was very interesting to see the way the whole story unfolded, how they found him, the DNA evidence, the same thing that happened years ago with the killer out in California. And you're just watching how this all happens so differently now. So when you're writing about this true crime that's happening, it happened in a very different time when we did not have all that available. Well, in California, you're talking about the Golden State Killer. And yes. Michelle McNamara wrote that book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, which then became the HBO series. She died in the process. Um, but she did say this will come out. He will be found. It will be advances in science. And indeed, it was. And of course, none of that was uh, even applicable in 1948. Mm -mm. The police in Pittsburgh were very disparaging of citizen detectives. We are no longer so disparaging of them. But citizen detectives can run amok when you think about TikTok. They can intrude. Mm -hmm. I do know that the case of the real murder in Pittsburgh was reopened in 2008. I happen to know it from a friend who's a prosecutor. And I've put a lot of that in this book, what I know about that. So it's fictionalized, but <laughs> thinly fictionalized. But there's a classic Japanese film, post-war Japanese film, and I think the director was Akira Kurosawa and it's called Rashomon. And Rashomon is the story of a rape that occurs in the forest and the trial, there are three witnesses who have seen this, eyewitnesses, and they tell completely different stories. Mm -hmm. They've seen three completely different things, and that happens so much. I've heard about people who've had car accidents where there are witnesses standing there, and they see the car turned, but footage reveals the car didn't turn at all. Mm -hmm. So going back to 1948, it is a different thing, but now we have more trackability. I'm interested now in this case up in Massachusetts of the husband. Yes. What is his name? Uh, I can't think of his name, I can't but, think of it. <laughs> he killed the wife and the lies are just so transparent and they found blood in the basement and weird tools. And then he went and bought the cleaning supplies, I, I mean, but that's ego. That That's um, someone's ego getting in the way. Well, I'm just thinking that some of these people, if they want to plot a crime, they need to really watch some, read some books ahead of time. But what you can, I mean, he was actually, they found on his computer that he was trying to figure out what, what you would do with a woman of that size to dispose of her. I mean, <laughs> how do you dispose of a body of this weight? Yes. Yeah, like, yeah, and then okay. he was, <laughs> his little boy's computer, which I find kind of disgusting. That's a really eerie, creepy thing. And then you wonder what happens to the children in a case like that. And that's going back to that. That's another reason I didn't want to treat this as nonfiction. Um, a great deal of suspicion has fallen on uh, the real girl's brother over the years. Mm -hmm. and I know he's still alive and he's quite, quite elderly. And I just don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. um, Go down that path. No, no, not going down. That. But you you definitely have in this book a lot of the intonations about what could have happened. You definitely, oh, yes. like okay. it's totally, totally there. But you know, these stories, I, I find very interesting. You watch the news, like watch the network news in New York. Okay. And they say, this is the man that was walking down the street and he hit the woman and he drove the car this way. And you see somebody that's got a mask like here and their hats down here. And the next day they go, we have found this guy. And I'm just, they're like, how do they do that? And I've decided that for true or for um, thriller writers right now, the ring camera, all these other things of how you can track people, it makes it harder and harder. Whereas if you're writing about a crime that happened in the forties, none of this existed. Well, yeah, you really have to, like in my second book, where a little girl's abandoned in Ruby Falls. I picked 1968 because I didn't want any technology because they can solve so many things. Not to even mention now there's biometric data that is being captured on us. I mean, your phone knows it's you 
when you don't even think you look like you, you feel like, oh, I've got a cold and I'm puffy and I've been sleeping and my hair is standing on end. Right. And your phone is like, yeah, that's you. <laughs> like what? <laughs> really? I, like, I, like I, me. I, I don't want to be recognized right now. Oh. Well, it's even the way they went through this guy from Idaho, the garbage at his parents' house to mm-hmm. find his father's DNA. And they rushed it to the lab to test it and then said, yes, go with the warrant. And then I just love this part. They're like 45, 50 FBI people swarm onto the house, break the doors and windows to go in to get them. And I'm just there like that hour of the night, ringing the doorbell wasn't going to work. Like, <laughs> I was just, wow, this is like really, really super crazy. So yeah, that's what's like, you know, going on right now. Oh my gosh. But I just think reading your book, I was so much in both of like the way you're weaving the story together and who knows the truth and who doesn't and what did really happen and what happens later on, because there's a, Thing that happens there's an end and then there's another thing and then there's another thing so there's three things towards the end i yeah. picked up on that <laughs> thank you yeah so you know i i mean one of the questions in the book can we outlive the things that have happened in our own families can mm. we change a destiny <clears throat> there's a subject of epigenetics inherited trauma And they're looking at it culturally, you know, groups like Native Americans and the genocide. How do you change the epigenetics of how that goes forward? Mm -hmm. Black Americans, slavery. How do you change what has happened to people? And it, it happens at a cellular level. You know, if you, there's a really interesting nonfiction book called It Didn't Start With You by Mark Woolen, which is about epigenetics. And they talk about mice. So they have these mice and they introduce a particular smell to the mice and then give them electric shocks. Two generations later, their grandchildren, if they smell that exact same smell, have reactions of stress and anxiety. So what is that? How is that passed down genetically? And I don't know the answer, but I think it's a big question. I think it's also a question of the people left behind. I remember um, uh, Klebold's mother did a book a couple of years ago of she was the killer's mother. I can't remember what it was called. And it was absolutely fascinating that this woman said goodbye to her son. And then he went to Columbine that day and shot up the school. And then for forever, that's how she was known as Dylan Klebold's mother in the food store, every single place she went. And the book was so well done of this is like this was the stranger that was in my house and I didn't even know I knew there were issues with him but I didn't know what the issues really could manifest themselves into very very interesting book so but you know you also wrote about something that happened in Argentina years ago that was like played into the book and I sat there and I was like I had no idea that this whole like passage happened share a little bit about that and why you wavered in because the Argentina part was interesting So I traveled to Argentina a decade ago with one of my best friends whose mother was born and raised there. So she's half Argentine. And one of the things that was so extraordinary on our trip is we went to visit right in the middle of Buenos Aires. There's this huge old military base that was the place where... So there was a, a a change in government and there was a very right-wing government. And this played out in the seventies into the early eighties. And they started picking up students, union leaders, anybody they perceived to be subversive and a threat to the stability of the country. And they would pop these hoods over people and throw them in a car and drive them around. And everybody thought that they were being taken far, far out of the city, but they were right in the middle of the city. And it just gave me a chill that you could be imprisoned and detained next door to where your family was, who didn't know you were there. Nobody knew they were in there. And the other aspect of it, some of the younger women, the students were pregnant or they became pregnant while uh, being in, you know, captives. And they did, so in this facility, they have letters on the walls that these girls were forced to write to their families saying, you know, dear mom and dad, uh, I'm leaving the country. I'm going off to Paraguay and making a fresh start. They would take the babies 
and give the babies for adoption to really their friends and cronies. And then they would throw these girls alive out of airplanes, alive. Wow. They would sedate them, but it was so horrific. And that, you know, obviously it stayed in my mind and it became a plot point in this book. Yeah. And it's like, I did not know about that. I didn't know about, you know, and especially now her children are on their way there. And she's thinking about what is this country really like? He's taking the children, what is going on? And they know he's he's on his way there. They're perfectly clear that that's what's going on. Man beyond the mask. And the other thing about um, <clears throat> those children who were taken, there then became this, there, there was a big movement of the grandmothers and the grandmothers would tie white headscarves uh, symbolic of the diapers of these babies who were taken from their daughters. And the grandmothers now are a force still in Argentina and they demand the DNA records of certain people who now would be in their 40s. And there was a huge case that made a lot of news when a son and a daughter of a very prominent Argentine family, I think they were a publishing family. So these grandmothers wanted these, these young adults to submit their DNA records. And these young adults said, we don't want to do it. We are happy. We like our families. So morally, it's a conundrum. What do you do with that? Like, wh where, who's right? Who's wrong? Who has a right? Who doesn't have a right? Very complicated. Now, is your mom still alive at this point? She is. And uh, she's living in Florida. And we had a fun launch party in Palm Beach on pub date last week. And she came and she did say, nobody's going to ask me about the real murder. I, I'm not really comfortable talking about that. And I said, mom, if anybody asks you, you just say that I am not really comfortable talking right. about this. Right. And nobody asked her, but it, it was very traumatic for her. I can imagine. I can imagine losing, losing somebody like that. It's this and she, she, me. I'm turning myself <laughs> Son. Here yeah, following go. the sun in the solar room. there you I'm go going away but it's you know yes because it's it's something that's wanted her she could have been there that night i think that you could have been there that night is a big deal you know it is so before becoming a writer you worked both sides of the camera you were an actress and you were a story editor how we mentioned you've mentioned a lot of movies you've mentioned a lot about cinematography how does that influence your writing you get you because it's a very cinematic way that you write so uh, how do I say this? I see it visually through the vehicle of words. Mm -hmm. So for me, words and images are, are married. Uh, when I was in college, the girls in my dorm played a little game and whatever, we were sitting in somebody's room and we, they asked various uh, among us to describe a room we were not in. They asked me to describe, you know, the shower room. And as I was sitting there, I had trouble conjuring, you know, the exact wall color or what were the exact tiles on the floor or this or that. And I discovered in college that if I couple words with images, it's sealed in my brain. Mm -hmm. So looking at you right now, if I say the words, your glasses are on your head and they, they're a black frame and they look rectangular, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just this blending now of what I see with, so I don't much like writing screenplays. I love movies beyond description. I have written a screenplay. I certainly edited tons of them when I was at Miramax, but I don't like the mechanics of writing a screenplay. I don't like the formatting of it. And I prefer to write a novel, but I see it as a film, if that makes any crazy sense. No, it does, because what you do is you see cinematically what needs to happen, but then you flush out the characters. Whereas cinematically, you're going to say, exit right, do this, do that. It's commands. Yeah, it's very clipped. Mm -hmm. And I also like description and I like digressions. You know, uh, in Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield, remember he was in class and the kids in class, if somebody would stand up to talk and move off the point, the other kids were supposed to say, digression, digression. Yeah. It's like, well, I like the digressions, which I do too, as long as you don't go too far. So for me, the editing process is I always need to curtail my digressions, but you see that very much in the voice of the writer. 
Mm -hmm. She definitely goes off in one thing uh, or another. Like one of the things I love discovering when I was talking about, or through her voice, Dominic Dunn, and her sections are very meta. She is self-referential. She is talking to the reader. But with Dominic Dunn, uh, I came across something that was just too good not to put in the book. That murder in yeah. Beach, uh, what was his name? Sullivan, who murdered his wife, and he lived in this house that's called the ham and cheese house. And it was just so wacky <laughs> that I thought, all right, that's going in. That's going in there. And there really is a reef road. There really is a yeah, reef road. Really is. So that was an interesting thing. So let's talk about the pandemic. So I'm writing in the mornings and then taking a break and riding my bike around the island. And I felt like, uh, well, first of all, it was a little bit of a twilight zone feeling because there was nobody anywhere. Yeah. And so I'm riding my bike down the middle of the road, up and down the island of Palm Beach. And I was looking for a street and the name Reef Road was so perfect. I like the alliteration. Mm -hmm. I like the implication of peril. You think of a coral reef, you know, a ship can run aground. It reminds me a little bit of places like, you know, Cape Fear or Lookout Mountain, you know, a place name that conjures a little danger. I love the north end of Palm Beach. It really is very neighborhoody year round. Like the south end is more the estates and the mansions, but the north end, it reminds me more of like Santa Monica, that kind of community where people really live. There were just so many things I liked about it. And uh, I picked a house. Uh, that house is gone now, the house that I had in my mind. Reef Road was really filled with a lot of ranch houses that looked like they were built in the 60s. But a lot of people have moved to Florida since COVID, you know, getting out of New York and everything. So the house I, I had in my mind is gone but I love I love writing real places I think mm -hmm. people experience a little thrill when they have been somewhere or know a place and they recognize something mm -hmm. I just think it's places like character for me it just adds I remember um, I think it's Clapton 461 Ocean Boulevard and I remember being in Florida with my boys and they're like let's just go drive past the house we've got the address we could go sit there and it's a real place and it's yeah, those real places that you sit there and say, I've seen that road. I've been where that is. Nice. It's really fun. You also have worked with your husband on a number of restoration projects, namely the Ocean House in Rhode Island. And restoration requires a lot of planning in advance, a lot of thinking in advance, a lot of you can change things, but you can't, you're restoring. You're not completely changing out the way a look of a place is. I feel like the light of the writing with you is like the restoration. You want to keep the story where it is, but how do you make it bigger and how do you um, embellish upon it? And do I have something there? You do have something there. It's a great analogy. I mean, in a way, some of the projects we've taken on in restoration, I, I like to say they're the kinds of projects you'd never take on if you actually knew what you were doing because the magnitude is so large. And I think that's true of writing a book in a way. You can't when you sit to write a book, you can't look at the end because it's too daunting. It's just too difficult. So you kind of have to take it in small doses and try to have the big picture and the small picture together. You can fix things. Like at the Ocean House, I remember um, <clears throat> my husband and I and the general manager who, who opened the hotel and a couple other people, we were traveling around Nantucket looking at hotels. And I said, so where's the hair salon? <laughs> and these guys said, what hair salon? I said, you're going to have a seaside hotel with weddings, brides, mothers of the brides, mother-in-laws, and no hair salon. So the spa director lost her office and we put in a hair salon. So that was a little bit of an edit. The hotel wasn't finished yet. Um, it was about a year from being finished, but this bunch of guys just hadn't conceived the idea you know, you're going to have ladies on the beach all day and then have a wedding. You need a hair salon. You got to do something. It's so so, good. <laughs> yeah. But that's, so I want to say something about that. That's the beauty of time with writing. Time to me is a very important factor where things germinate in your head and you get some clarity or you get a revelation when you're not writing. So my revelation about the hair salon, we weren't even at the hotel. We were walking around Nantucket, other hotels, 
and it hit me. So you've got to build in, you can't be too rushed. You've mm-hmm. got to build in the time. With Finding Mrs. Ford, there was a moment a year after I'd written something. So I was still in the editorial process, but I wasn't even thinking about this particular problem. And I woke up in the middle of the night with this jolt and I thought, oh, I can't write that like that. I'm not gonna say what it is if someone hasn't read the book, but had it stayed in the book exactly the way I wrote it, something would have been a ticking time bomb revealing to other characters Mm-hmm. that something else was going on. And I'd so blithely put this thing in without any thought and I was able to fix it. But that you can't always fix unless you take a little time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you also need to be there to see the issue. Years ago, we renovated an office in, the, in New York. It was probably a decade ago now. And the construction guys were there and they said, you know, you could go home. And I said, that's your dream. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I am going to be here all the time. And I I stood at my desk working and my son who works with me was standing at a desk working. But there are a lot of times where they ended up then coming to me for solutions because I was there. And they're like, well, what if we did this or we did that? And they understood I knew what I was talking about. And it was interesting because at the beginning, they completely dismissed me as like, just go home and we'll just tell you when it's done. And I said, but then it might not be the way I wanted it. Little lady, just go home, little lady. But you know, that's true. You have to when you're doing building and stuff, you do realize you want to walk this way, but they've put the door here. And suddenly you realize there's no logic in that. Let's move the door because there's something wrong about, and that you only get when you're there. And the same with writing. I mean, one of the things I do is I read my books aloud later on. I don't do it at the beginning because, you know, everything's sort of messy. But as I'm getting into final edits, and it takes forever, as you can imagine. But if you read something aloud, uh, suddenly you realize, I've said the word sublime Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. five times in this book. Mm -hmm. I really need the sources. I got to get off that. And it's a mistake not to read the book aloud. Mm -hmm. Particularly... I love the rhythm of words. I love the cadence and the rhythm and and just how it all flows together. And it needs to trip off the tongue or you need to fix it. Well, you're, it's interesting you say that because with the um, way that audiobooks are now selling and way people are listening to audio, it has completely changed what happens with the book because it's when you get your uh, like your statement of what's going on, it's your uh, these are your print rights, your audio rights, your ebook rights. It's a story of what's going on. And I always joke on this pod, on this um, series that it used to be like selling your rights to Finland, like it didn't really matter. And now the audio rights are such a big deal because it's such a big part of the telling of the story. And I want to talk about the narrator. It's Saskia, you know, tell me a little bit about her and why you selected her to do the book. So Saskia Marlevel read my first book and now she's read my third book. First of all, her voice is just yummy. She has this slightly whiskey throated, sexy, soft voice. She can do accents in the most subtle way. I like subtle gradations of voice uh, and character voices in an audiobook for adults. I don't want to feel like I'm being spoon fed a Saturday morning cartoon with, you know, really outrageously ridiculous voices. Her voice just lures you in. Uh, she's a linguist. She speaks foreign languages. I tend to use a little bit of one language or another. I've used French, Italian, and now Spanish in each of my books successfully, successively. I, I would like to say successfully. That's a Freudian slip. Successively. Um, I love Stephanie Wills, read my second book, uh, Ruby Falls. Her voice is wonderful too. More youthful voice, perfect for that book. But uh, yeah, so we did go back to Saskia and I just love her voice. But I will say in ebook, and in audiobook, Reef Road is in the top 100. It's toggled between like 83 up to 41 of in mystery, thriller, suspense, and psychological literary fiction. So I'm very, very pleased with its performance this first week. Um, 
you know, it's got stiff competition in the hardcover with Prince Harry's book coming out. It's, it's, there's a lot. I mean, it's yeah. a lot right now because there are also, because I've been looking at the list, there are a lot of fall books that stayed on. And there are years that that happens in January and there are years it doesn't. And I think that this year, one of the things is the tight economy. I think that people are buying what they know and have heard about. And I think that, but there are other times where that doesn't happen. And there have been Januaries where like the maid broke through last year that books could actually really do this, but you're not seeing it as much. You're not seeing as much. I mean, and I've been looking at this. I've been looking at numbers and watching. It's it's a much more difficult market. No, it's fascinating. So I'm super thrilled with both yeah. the audio and the ebook performance. And I'm happy with the hardcover performance too. And we also had a really nice CNN piece last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty unheard of for nonfiction. And it's because of the true crime component. True crime component of it. Also, okay, let's talk about the cover. Let's talk about the title. Yeah. Reef Road. Okay, first of all, was that always the title going in? From the get-go. Yep. I, I just, like I said, that, that scary place name, it just conjured up everything. And the cover, so all of my books, uh, the covers are absolutely gorgeous, but there's something weird and off. So here you have the beautiful birds of paradise, but they're very off center. Mm -hmm. You know, literary fiction, you might have them straight in the middle, looking very pretty. And then if you look deep in, there's a spider. Mm -hmm. And so it's beautiful, but it's ominous. Mm -hmm. It's inviting, but something is wrong. And I love the subtlety of that. And I've been so pleased with all three of my book covers, but I think this one just pops I think just thing I like about it is the the white on the black. It's it's yeah. very strong. You can see the title. I was going to say that the white on the black, and I haven't seen a lot of covers looking like this. I haven't seen you know the black cover with the really strong image, and I just think it really completely works. So you're on this full book tour right now. I mean, I'm going to try. I'll see the CNN piece is online, right? It's online. CNN piece is okay. online. We'll yeah. link to that in the notes down below, everybody. Right. So if you want to watch that piece, we definitely will link out to that as well. So you're on this full book tour. Do you talk to book groups as well? Like, I know this is not the timing to be doing this, but later on, will you? Absolutely. I love talking to book groups. I love talking to book clubs, libraries, bookstores. For me, as a new-ish writer, the most important thing I can do other than write books is to actually talk to readers because it makes a complete difference. And then once I've had the chance to talk to people, they read one book, then they read all three books and you know, it's, it is the, the relationship a writer needs is with the reader. Yeah. And it is. And a lot of times people are trying to figure out it's just the industry and it's not, it's talking to the reader, seeing what their feedback is, hearing what they're doing as a takeaway. Like I said, when I sat there and I said, uh, there's a measured beginning to this book and then whoosh, we just take off, you know, and it keeps you reading with those short chapters. So what's next? Do you have a book in mind next or what can you do? <laughs> I do. So I got an email last year from a man who began, he said, remember me? I was your best boy on survival game. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very provocative sentence. It's actually a really intriguing sentence. So a best boy in the movie business is the head electrician and survival game was a movie I did. So you know, I'm reading and I'm thinking, hmm, not quite yet. I don't quite remember you. And he said, remember that Thanksgiving dinner we had together? You were the only actress who, you know, was all alone and nobody came to visit her. I'm like, oh, really? I don't, I don't quite remember that. <laughs> and he said, and then remember when I saw you a couple of years later at the Cannes Film Festival and you were holding a baby and you waved at me. And for a minute, I thought, could that baby be mine? And I'm thinking, <laughs> he said, but I knew it couldn't be possible. And I'm like, and I hope it couldn't be possible because maybe we didn't have that nature of a relationship because I don't remember you. So I looked him up. He's a real guy. Obviously, he worked on the film. But I got to thinking, so what if you have a woman who has a flawed memory? She was an actress. She's left the business. Somebody reaches out to her. What if he's telling the truth? But what if he's not? So I'm about 100 pages in. Right now, I'm calling it Best Boy. And we shall see about that. But I just... It just fell out of the sky and it was so interesting. And someone asked me, as I was talking to some readers last week, uh, this person said, well, will you tell that guy you're writing this book? I said, yeah, I probably should. Uh, <laughs> but it was just too good to pass up. 
yeah, it's like this little phrase of, wait a second, did I know you? Wait, what do you remember about me? And you remember a lot more. And so you start to question memory. Memory is a very tricky thing. We talked about it earlier. Yeah. It's like, what do you see and what do you do? Well, I remember the event you did this summer and it so intrigued me to want to read the book. And I am so glad that you got to talk to readers today because I'm thinking that you definitely whet their appetite more for reading the book besides my couple of paragraphs I wrote the other day, because it is this book that I'm, I'm looking for different this year as well. I'm looking when I look for, you know, bets on there's a lot of the same plots going over and over. And I'm looking for something that this is not locked room. This is not this. This is not that. It's a completely different kind of story. And also the, the true crime element of your past, when you tell that story of how it really could haunt you for the rest of your life of what ended up happening. Very, very interesting. So thank you, Carol. Thank you for everything you do for writers and readers. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. That's a pleasure to talk to you too. Thank you so much for your time joining us. We want to hear from you when, what's next. We're ready to hear about best boy. <laughs> as soon as okay. talk about soon, it. soon. Okay. Thank you. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks To. Also remember, we're going to put an audio clip at the end of the podcast. So any of you like to hear the audio clip, you'll be able to do that. And join us next time for our next Book Reporter Talks To interview. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.